Ah, there you are. Hi, Ed. There you are. There you are. Okay, why isn't it connecting? Fuck. Uh, Hi, Ed. Ah, hi, Lori. Hello there, everybody. No. No. Okay, hold I on a second. Hear you. No, I can't. Can you hear me now? Hello, hello. Can anybody hear me? Thumbs up, thumbs down, if you can hear me. I can't hear you. Fuck. Really? Piper, we can hear you. <laughs> Piper, we hear you. A lot of f bombs. Well, I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why Piper, I can't hear you. We hear, we hear yeah. your many f. <laughs> Look. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. I'll shut my mouth. I can't hear it, guys. I can't hear you. Fuck. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Loud and clear. <laughs> okay, so just uh, so you guys know, uh, when uh, Peter Haven get. By the way, Piper, can you text me Peter Haven's number? I just want him to know yeah, yeah, yeah. my text number, so that he, in, in case while we're on, he needs in case Hi. he needs any support. Um, I'm just going to be here as tech support, not as a contributor. But I just want to make sure Peter knows that and knows that I'm available for him in case he has a question on how to do anything. Okie dokie, Smokey. Okay, hang on. Can some who's on? Can no, somebody mute it or who is that? Oh, there you go. Piper, you, Piper, you and I are the only one unmuted. Uh, because for, for this call, for this call, we're probably going to get quite a few people on here very soon, and I just yeah, want to make sure that the audio audio is clear for Peter. Got it. Okay, hang on. I know he's wrapping up with Beach Cities. So okay. I told him I wanted to make sure, right, that he dials in, but. Hey, where is his number? <laughs> oh, there's Peter. Come out, Peter. Okay. Two one three eight four two. <laughs> oh, I've never sat so much before in my life. So what oh. I'll do, Piper, is I'll include you here on a text with Peter as well. I should have right. told you to just group text us, but. Um, uh, well, you want to start that party? Are we recording this, please? Yes, we are. And by the Great. way, we, record, we recorded the team meeting on Wednesday. Um, right. I haven't recorded the morning meetings, but uh, the team meeting on Wednesday, I just need to get together with, we'll take this offline, but I, I need to get together with Tara to get me yeah. access to the, the YouTube uh, so that we can post stuff up to our private YouTube, Ke Keller Williams Larchmont. So I think for some reason that the guy before me, um, oh, there's Peter. Hi, Peter. You just have to unmute yourself, Peter. Oh, I'm unmute. No, there you Peter, are. You're, I just unmuted you, Peter. You're good. Excellent. Hey, Peter, uh, uh, you and I have met. I don't know if you remember. I'm Ed Morrill. I'm going to be kind of running tech for you here during, this, during the Zoom call. So if you need anything at all, just call out. You can, there's a chat bar on the side here. So if you go down to the bot, I don't know if you know how well you know Zoom. Well, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm getting up to speed with it. I see the <laughs> chat bar yeah. and uh, I've just opened it. So, um, uh, you know, generally speaking, on the last, I just got off one of these phone calls. There were a lot of people yeah. on, and I had to mute most of them. But uh, if yep. people want to ask questions by chat, that's fine. Any other way they want to do it, that's fine. 
So what I will tell everybody is that uh, very soon here, I'm going to mute everybody except Peter. And if you, you all are, you all can unmute yourselves, but just know that if you want to ask a question or whatever, just unmute yourself using the, uh, the there's a, an icon on your bottom left part of your Zoom screen. Um, there's a place to unmute yourself when, when you're muted. So just unmute yourself before you ask a question and then mute it back when you're done, just so that we can keep the audio as clean as possible so that we don't have a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, stuff from around all of our households uh, interfering with audio. That's really great information. I did not realize that, although I, now that you've said that, it makes sense because some people, even though I had muted them, were still asking questions, and I thought, well, thank goodness for that. Thank you. That's yeah. good to know. It, as the host, I've got access here where I can, you know, make sure everyone's muted whenever, you know, to, to do a few things here. So, uh, Peter, if you want to share your screen, that, that's available to you as well, I believe. Um, Okay. Uh, now. Yeah, you, you, you should. Yeah, that's you, right? That's you sharing yeah, your. Yeah, that's me. Now, you, can you see this and this? Can I can, you... although the. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm. Yeah, I'm seeing what's on your screen. So yes. Yeah. So here's the agenda. You, you may want to. You may want to zoom out. Yeah. Okay. I'll zoom out. Um, okay. Ah, that much okay. better. You can all see this. Uh, move that over there. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, well, we'll wait a couple more minutes and then I guess we'll get ready to go. Yeah, exactly, Peter. Yeah, we still, we're still at 1058 here. So maybe if we could make like, wait, if you, if you could wait three or four minutes, so give, give everybody a couple extra minutes to, to, to find the meeting and all that. And uh, I'm fine. I'm, I'm ready to go whenever you want and no rush. Perfect. While we're all still waiting a couple minutes, I'll tell you guys a couple of jokes. If you need 144 rolls of toilet paper for a 14 day quarantine, you probably should have been seeing a doctor long before COVID-19. <laughs> uh, uh, very good, very good. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can see this. <laughs> Someone just sent this to me. Um, hold, hold, hey, Peter, hold on, I'm, I'm gonna what take is your it? screen off. I'm gonna take a yeah, I'm gonna take a screen off. I'm gonna take a screen off showing Peter. Uh, hold on a second. Here. You, you'll you'll get it back. Hold on. Uh, hey Peter, can can you unstop your your screen sharing? Yeah. We st we still got a couple of minutes here. I was gonna show this to you guys. So let me see if I can put it up close enough. It says, uh, <laughs> "Where's Wally? Coronavirus edition." Jesus and Christ. <laughs> and there's, there's an empty beach with just Wally on it. <laughs> Because you know how where's where's uh where's, where's Waldo always Waldo? has where's Waldo uh -huh. always has where always has like a crap you know crowded thing <laughs> it's all it's like here he, is, here he is downtown and there's just him in the street <laughs> and here he is in the forest and it's it's just Wally or just Waldo people have too much stuff on too much time in their hands. Oh hey Tiff, hi. I'm 
<laughs> can you guys see that? Hello. <laughs> you know what that is? That's the Olympic Games Tokyo 2020 uh, uh, safety distance, they call it. <laughs> <laughs> That's very <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> optimistic it presumes there's actually going to be the olympics right <laughs> okay with that I'll, I'll turn it all over. so i'm going to mute everybody except peter here and peter i will turn it all over to you um and it, we'll stop a few people joining on but we'll we'll let them catch up and by the way we are recording this as well so you can catch us at a later time as well no problem thank you uh thanks to everybody for being here and um i'm grateful for the assistance with uh this Zoom chat conferencing, this is the, basically the first time I've done this. I just finished a, a conversation with another office uh, just a few minutes ago, so I'm just gonna try to uh, delve back into it. And uh, thank you all for being here. I know we're dealing with some challenging circumstances these days, obviously, and the landscape that we're living in and trying to survive in is changing from one minute to the next. And uh, uh, honestly, as I went to bed last night, I thought that really the now I've got to sort of look at all these uh, stay at home orders and try to figure out, uh, you know, what they say, which I haven't done yet. But our landscape is really changing. And these are challenging times. But I'm confident that this will obviously pass and things will return to normal at some point in time. Uh, it may be a while, but we're all going to get there. <clears throat> um, in our industry, obviously, this presents some very real challenges because we're very much a people industry. We're very much uh, an industry dependent upon going out and about, meeting people, showing people things, and taking them to property. So obviously, these are challenging times. Um, and uh, this car form that we're going to talk about it really sort of evolved in, in my opinion, in the last week or so. I think that Carr may have been looking at it perhaps two weeks ago. I don't know, but it's just my sense because I, it really just sort of came up and running only in the past week. And I think Carr, you know, it, for those of you who've heard me talk before, I, I'm really grateful and I think we're all very lucky that we have uh, these car forms because these forms are very comprehensive and I think car has done a very good job of trying to address these issues as best it can in a relatively short period of time and um, I think they've done that uh, it's not perfect it's not seamless but I do think that they've managed to achieve that um, and we're going to talk about the form we're going to go through it in a minute from my point of view I think it's important to take a step back and just look at what we're trying to address here. It may seem obvious, but I think uh, talking about it and articulating it helps. For me, when these issues started to arise, the single greatest issue that presented itself to me is a situation where, let's say we have a typical, uh, a typical contract, a 30-day escrow. And let's say that the buyer is scheduled to remove their inspection and loan contingencies let's just say day 17 and day 21, and the close of escrow is not scheduled to occur until day 30. Well, there's a gap. If the buyer timely removes their contingencies, there's a gap there for about nine days if the buyer, uh, if for buyer to be susceptible to any of these sort of COVID issues that are beyond the buyer's control, which may not make it possible or practical for the buyer to close escrow timely on the 30th day. And that puts a buyer at risk. A buyer is susceptible to the circumstances associated with um, COVID and, and the coronavirus, and their deposits at risk because they've removed all contingencies. And I think one of the things that this form tries to do, and for me it's an important goal, is to try to provide the buyer with some type of protection for those types of eventualities. And we'll go through the form, we'll talk about the protections that it provides. And some people may say, well, it just gives the buyer a complete ability to vacate the deal. That's not the way the form is written. I can't control how the form is gonna be used out there in the field, so to speak, with people, um, uh, you know, what circumstances they're gonna rely upon and use, but the form is written as narrowly as it can be, and also as broadly as it can be, which sounds like a contradiction, but that's what they've done, and I think that's the only thing they can do. 
So the form makes a lot of sense from the buyer perspective. <clears throat> and I think one question that's gonna come up on these transactions is what does the seller get out of it? Why should the seller agree to any of this? And I think one of the answers to that is, I don't know what's happening out there in the market right now. A week ago, two weeks ago, I was hearing stories about it being a seller's market and sellers were making all kinds of demands on buyers. They wanted this, they wanted that. They were saying multiple counters and submit all these offers. I don't know if it's still like that because I think this has obviously got people very concerned and I think when there's that level of concern, it's very likely uh, that uh, that'll have a chilling effect on offers. So if the seller isn't going to provide the buyer with some type of assurance and protection, that could chill offers, that, that would make buyers reluctant to make offers. And I think in this market, uh, buyers are going to need all the comfort and reassurance they can. And so I think maybe the market, these things may have shifted um, uh, the market a little bit. I don't know. It may be, it'll still be too early to say. The other thing is that, uh, as Carr points out, and we'll talk about this, it may be the case for whatever reason that the seller can't perform here due to a COVID related circumstance. Um, it's possible that the seller could be taken ill. It's possible that the seller may not be able to vacate their property because uh, of their physical condition or their illness. Um, I think it's also possible that a seller may not be able to, to go before a notary and have documents notarized, which would be essential to closing an escrow and recording title. So even though the agreement on its face seems to favor buyers, and I think it does, and I think it should, it nevertheless benefits sellers because I don't think it's not entirely clear that sellers will be immune from these unforeseen circumstances as well. So I do think it provides benefits to sellers. They may not be apparent at first blush, but I think they're there. Um, and as we're gonna talk about as well, all of this is, is optional. In other words, the buyer and the seller don't have to agree to these amendments and provisions if they don't want to, but I do think it's in their interest to, uh, to consider agreeing to these provisions. And I think that when we're talking to our buyers and sellers, um, these are some of the points I would try to emphasize to them. <clears throat> um, the, um, from a buyer's point of view, I do think that because this form has now been created, um, the creation of a car form arguably creates a kind of standard of practice for buyer's agents. And because the form exists, I do think that we are obligated to talk to our buyers about this form and to include it with offers. And um, we can discuss with our buyers what boxes we want to check and provisions, but I do think it's good to recommend to a buyer that they use this form in their offer. The buyer doesn't have to agree, but for obvious reasons, I think the buyer may want to. Now, some buyers may come back and say, you know what, I don't want to have this form. I'm concerned that it will hurt my offer and, uh, uh, you know, I just don't want to do it. And that's fine. And in fact, that's a good scenario for us if we're representing buyers because we will have proposed the form, we will have discussed it, and the buyer will have said no. Um, I think the more likely scenario is that we're going to have to be um, encouraging sellers to consider and accept these forms and uh, some of the reasons we've already talked about. And that's just going to be a challenge that we all have to face as we, uh, as we continue to go forward. Now let's look at the forms themselves. And um, I'm going to do a, uh, a share screen here. Oh, before I do that, I, I, there was a couple of points I wanted to make. Um, the car agreement has within it contingencies. And the big contingencies that I think are gonna be relevant to this topic are inspection and loan. And, uh, you know, I, my the loan is typically a 21 day period, I believe, and the inspection is typically a 17 day period. But the car agreement specifically says that a contingency is in place until it is removed. So um, it, just because the time period has passed for removal of a contingency doesn't mean that the contingency is gone. In fact, the car agreement, the purchase agreement is written 
So that contingency remains until the buyer removes it in a writing signed by the buyer. And that's called the continuation of contingency provision. So if buyers are not able to get these types of assurances from sellers in their transactions, buyers still have the ability to hang on to contingencies. Now, I'm not saying that that doesn't come with a bit of a price tag, and the price tag is that a seller can issue a notice to perform, and a seller can say, well, I want you to remove your contingency, and I'm gonna issue a notice to perform asking you to remove your contingency. And I personally believe, and I've always believed, that notices to perform are good, um, and I think they're actually good for buyers. And I know that there's a lot of preference out there for avoiding notices to perform, um, and I can understand it, but the contract specifically provides for it. And when you get a notice to perform as a buyer, it gives you two days to comply, and you have two days to talk with your buyer about how you're going to comply. And you also have two days to talk to the listing agent about your response. And if you don't have an agreement in place to address these unforeseen COVID circumstances, you now have an opportunity to discuss with the listing agent during that two day period. And you can say things like, well, my buyer's concerned. You know, we offered, we wanted to have this language at the beginning of the transaction, but you didn't agree to it. And uh, my buyer's concerned. They, you know, there's a concern they may not, their loan may not fund. There's a concern that, you know, uh, inspections may be delayed, so they don't want to remove that. And th that type of discussion can lead to some sort of resolution or compromise. And if your buyer is really concerned, they can simply hang on to their contingencies. And yes, there's a risk that the deal may cancel, but one of the most important things that we're trying to do from the buyer's point of view is protect their deposit. <clears throat> and that's really what a contingency does at the end of the day. It gives the buyer a valid reason to cancel and it protects their right to get their deposit. So there are other ways to do this other than using this uh, uh, COVID addendum. Uh, but as I said, I do think this is now going to be part of our industry right now, and we need to have these discussions with our clients regardless. Um, and uh, secondly, the, the agreement or the addendum is designed to serve as one of two possible scenarios. It can be an addenda, which is an addendum, which is attached to an offer. So it's made a part of an offer and the seller can counter it, not agree to it, um, do whatever they want in the way of a response but it also can be used as an amendment to an existing purchase escrow transaction right now. So if you don't have these protections right now, you can seek this amendment and see if the buyer, uh, the seller in particular will agree to it and provide your buyer with some assurances and protections. And if your buyer still has all their contingencies, that gives them some leverage to exercise before they remove those contingencies because uh, they might want this extra protection before they do that. Now, let's just talk about the form. I'm going to try to do a share screen here, and we'll walk through the form uh, as best we can. Let's see here. Okay. Um, so, I think, let me see. Can hey, Peter, uh, if you go down to the bottom of your, of your Zoom screen, there you go. Okay. You're good. Yeah, so is that is that form up there? Can you see it now? Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, Piper, I appreciate that. All right, uh, I'll try to move this down. Okay, so as we talked about earlier. Hey, hey Peter, you might, you might wanna zoom out a little bit. Yeah. Got it. Okay, as we talked about earlier, uh, the form is uh, both an addendum or an amendment. So it can be on an escrow transaction right now on a purchase agreement that's already been executed, this form can be proposed. Uh, we can't guarantee that everyone will agree to it, but we can propose it. It can also be an addendum to uh, an offer and the seller can respond to it as they wish. You know, it's, um, I, you know, I always talk about these things with car forms. I think it's really wonderful that car keeps coming out with these forms and that these forms keep being revised and uh, you know, here we have a, a form that's literally brand new. It was created, I think, within the last week. And it's just another testimony, I think, to how CAR tries to evolve and provide us with these forms. And I think they keep up with the circumstances that we face in our industry. And we'll talk about this in a minute. I think it's also a good reason 
why I constantly advise agents not to significantly revise these forms and add language that could be uh, contradictory or ambiguous. Uh, all right. Um, one of the things that the form talks about, and it's a bit of legalese, is it talks about something called a force majeure clause. And obviously that's legalese. Uh, a force majeure clause is a provision that's put into a contract that basically says, if something really unforeseeable happens and it prevents performance, then uh, a force majeure clause will allow the parties to cancel, suspend, or terminate performance. The purchase agreement, as it's currently written, really does not have a force majeure clause. There is a statute on the books in California which provides that all contracts can be, in effect, by statute, have a force majeure clause. But as real estate agents, we really don't want to get into that. Um, there is no express force majeure clause. And it's also not clear whether these COVID circumstances are actually going to constitute a valid force majeure under existing California law. So this is just set up by way of example. This is an attempt um, to create a kind of force majeure clause and add it to the agreement right now. And that's really what, uh, what Carr is doing. And then they describe the force majeure circumstances, um, unprecedented impacts on our industry. I think that's uh, obvious and safe to say, including but not limited to travel restrictions, um, governmental uh, required isolations. I mean, my goodness, um, uh, you know, we, we've just recently received these orders that we're all supposed to stay at home. It's really not clear how a lot of people in our industry are going to react to that. And it's not just us that we're talking about. We're talking about third party providers, many of whom may say, well, we're not doing it and we're not going. Now, I don't know if that's going to be the case. But that's obviously a dramatic change in the world. And that change has literally occurred in the last 24 hours here in California. Uh, closures of government offices and services that are necessary for escrow transactions. You know, a lot of my work involves going to court and the courts are closing. Uh, trials are being continued. Um, judges are telling us don't come into the courthouse. We have um, call-in features that we can use uh, to speak to the court, but the courts are basically trying to keep their staff out of the courtroom. Everything is kind of slowing down right now, and um, we don't know all the ways this will impact in our transactions, but I think it's, it's certainly reasonable and certain to say it will have some impact. Now, let's get into the meat and potatoes of the form. With these forms, and this form in particular, there is what I like to call a triggering event. In other words, these first paragraphs are nice. It's kind of like blah, blah, legalese, tell you what you already know, blah, blah. But this is what we call the triggering event <clears throat> for me. And this long sentence is essentially, the beginning part of it is the triggering event. And the first thing it says, if there is something, an event that, interferes with the close of escrow. Close of escrow. Now, what does close of escrow mean? In this context, the close of escrow means the scheduled close of escrow date under the contract. So what we're referring to here is the ability of the parties to close on the date that is then presently in agreement per the purchase agreement or any amendments or extensions. So that's what close of escrow refers to. That's gonna be a specific date. Now, then it goes on to say, if the ability to close on that day is not possible or practical, and that is Carr's attempt to really tighten up this language a little bit, and it's worth spending a minute or two just to talk about it. Not possible sounds clear. I think we'll all know when something is not possible. What's an example of it? Well, I was trying to think of an example, an example that I came up with in my mind, and you all in the field with your transactions, you're gonna have more samples that, that, that I can ever have, but uh, let's just say you're on a typical 30-day escrow, and the lender has indicated on day 15 or 16 that there's no way they're gonna be able to approve a loan by day 30. It's just, they tell you, 
or the buyer. It's not possible, okay? Well, I mean, we have to take the lender at their word. And let's say the lender says it's because of uh, COVID circumstances. And so that's a situation where it is, it is literally, according to what we're being told by the lender, it's not going to be possible to close on the 30th. Okay, fine. Now, the next phrase, or practical, that may seem like a kind of significant softening, but really it isn't. Uh, something that is not practical, in my opinion, is something that may theoretically be possible, but it's really not practically possible. And the example I came up with is, let's say in the loan scenario, the, the, the buyer, you know, the buyer uh, agent advised the listing agent that the lender has stated that there's no way they're going to be able to close in 30 days. They can't do it. It's not going to happen. And it's all because of uh, COVID circumstances. Um, you know, we can all imagine somebody on the other side of the transaction, a listing agent or a seller saying, well, too bad. Go find another lender and get this done uh, in 15 days or 14 days. Well, in my opinion, that's not really practical. It's not practical for the buyer in mid-transaction to start the whole process over again and try to structure a loan within that time period. Uh, so for me, that's an example of something that's not practical. The point I'm trying to make is that this is a narrowing provision. It's designed to address circumstances that make it not possible to close on the date that escrow is scheduled to close or not practical, which is not just difficult, but it's really not practical to expect us to do that. And then after that, that's a, a narrowing trigger event. And then the rest of it just kind of opens up. Um, and it says, as a result of any unforeseen circumstances related to COVID, uh, the coronavirus. And they give you some examples. Um, inability to travel to sign documents, closing or delays in related government or business services, county recorders say, uh, other government services, um, you know, uh, uh, maybe public inspections, issuance of public uh, inspection reports. We don't know how inspection reports may be affected by this, uh, or permit reports. And I know that's not our job to get permit reports, but there may be reasons for the buyer to obtain those. The buyer may have contracted with somebody to try to get those permit reports, but guess what? They can't. Um, delays by lenders, title, escrows, assessors, and all of this is generally referred to as unforeseen circumstances. So if there's any unforeseen circumstance related to COVID that makes it not possible or not practical to close the escrow on time by the scheduled date, then these potential provisions, the parties agree that these provisions kick in. And before you get to those, it reminds everyone that all the other provisions in the purchase agreement as agreed to by the parties still remain in full force and effect. So that would be the case even if they didn't say that, but they're saying it just to remind us that that is the case. Um, so let's say you have one of these unforeseen COVID circumstances that make it impossible or impractical to close the escrow on time, the first thing that this amendment or addendum does is it says, if that's the case, then the buyer and seller agree to postpone the close of escrow by up to 30 days. You can write in an additional number there if you want, that's all subject to the negotiation process, but it's built in to be at 30. And also this entire section one here is built into the form. So it's going to be part of the agreement unless somebody completely strikes it out. And I don't see that happening. And why would they even agree to this if they're gonna completely strike that out? But, you know, we can't prevent that. I don't think that's something we wanna encourage people to do, but in theory, they could completely strike it out. But unless they do that, which I think is rare, and I don't think we're gonna see that, that is built in, that's part of the agreement. That's basically what it says. If there is an impossible or impracticality, that, that if there's an unforeseen COVID circumstance that makes it impossible or impractical to close on time, then the parties agree they're going to extend the escrow by 30 days. And then it basically says this, if that situation is not resolved within the 30 days, 
after that time period, then either party can cancel. Either party may cancel the agreement. So let's just say the buyer or the seller is quarantined, bedridden, sick, and you know we don't know if they're gonna improve or not. Uh, that's an unforeseen circumstance. That makes it impractical or impossible for them to get to a notary. And um, so we're gonna agree to continue to uh, extend the transaction close date by 30 days. And if that time period expires and that situation still hasn't changed, then uh, either party may cancel and they may simply cancel. No notice to perform uh, or demand to close escrow is required. And as we talked about, one of the most important things we're trying to do here is protect the deposit for the buyer. And this says that the deposit will be returned to the buyer. So basically, if there are these unforeseen circumstances, the parties agree that they'll kick the escrow close date by 30 days. And then if the situation hasn't resolved in 30 days, the impossibility or impracticality hasn't gone away, then everybody agrees that either one can cancel and the deposit goes back to the buyer. Now, I actually believe that this entire paragraph one sort of includes these other sections here, and I'll explain that in a moment, uh, but it doesn't expressly say that. This is the overall sort of the, the wide end of the funnel that tries to address with this situation. These things attempt to narrow it, but I do think that they're sort of included in this regardless, but let's, let's talk about that nevertheless. If this paragraph is checked, and these are, these are all optional, buyers can, sellers, buyers can check any provisions they want, sellers can agree or not agree to these provisions, but if this provision is checked, then um, it provides as follows. If the buyer has already removed their loan contingency and the buyer cannot fund their loan and close escrow on time due to the buyer's loss of income from COVID related issues. Now, uh, ironically, we literally had a situation that arose with this within the last, I think it was yesterday that I was talking about it, and a buyer had removed their loan contingency and they were furloughed. Their employer put them on furlough because the employer is obviously losing business revenue, so they're, they're putting workers on furlough. They may be laying them off entirely. And so now the buyer doesn't, uh, or has a potential problem with demonstrated proof of income, which the lender may require as a condition prior to close. And so what, what can the buyer do? They've already removed their loan contingency. Well, if this box is checked, then that means that if the buyer can't fund the loan because of that circumstances, then once again, either party may cancel and the deposit shall be returned to the buyer. And the buyer has this even if, even if their loan contingency has removed, notwithstanding the buyer may have removed their loan contingency. So this is an attempt to give the buyer a secondary or narrow loan contingency based upon a loss of income that prevents them from getting their loan. Now, I told you before that I thought this was the large part of the funnel and this was just smaller. To me, if the buyer is not able to fund their loan because they've been furloughed or placed on leave, I personally don't think that situation is gonna get any better in 30 days. So I really believe that this condition is already included in this, but it does, you know, you have to wait the 30 day period. Uh, nevertheless, CAR has made this a specific item which can also be checked. In my opinion, it's probably in the buyer's benefit during the offering stage to check that box, uh, but that's subject to discussion between the agent and the buyer if they wanna check that box or not. Um, you know, I've told you that I think this is sort of subsumed in this, but I can't say with certainty that some difficult listing agent on the other side would disagree and say, no, you didn't check that box and it's separate. And so we don't consider it to be part of this. I think that's absolutely wrong, but nevertheless, I can't stop people from making that argument. And as agents, I often tell people, 
we don't want to have the winning argument. We don't want to have the right argument. What's best for us is if we have no argument. So we want to try to minimize arguments as best we can. Now, if we can't, and if we have to have an argument, then we will do our best to have the winning or the best argument. But the best argument of all, the winning argument is no argument. So I think it's probably in buyer's interest to check this box going in, but you know that's subject to individual discretion and the seller can always counter it out. Um, I don't think this situation is gonna be improved in 30 days, so I still think it would be captured by this anyway. I think any argument to the contrary is ultimately without merit, but I point those issues out to you nevertheless. The third option, which can be checked, and all of these can be checked, um, is buyer and seller, if there is a, uh, an inability to close escrow due to an impossibility or impracticality as a result of a COVID circumstance, then one option is you don't gotta wait 30 days, it doesn't have to be due to the loss of income, whatever it is, everybody agrees to cancel and move on. So this is an agreement up front before um, these conditions arise or, or, or you know, uh, assuming it's not an amendment, assuming it's an addendum to the purchase agreement, where you're saying that one option that everybody has is just end it, just stop this, everybody cancels and you walk away. Um, again, whatever the circumstance is, if it's not resolved in 30 days, I think you're gonna end up here anyway, uh, but there may be reasons why people might not wanna wait the full 30 day period. They might want to just agree up front that they can cancel at any time and move on. Um, I actually think that makes a lot of sense, uh, but I can understand people's reluctance to enter into it. I personally think that basically there should be a contingency in these agreements for sort of any COVID circumstance that makes it really difficult, if not uh, or impractical, to close and parties should be free to separate each other as soon as possible because I think that's ultimately in everyone's interest. Now that's me as a lawyer and I wanna minimize risk, I wanna minimize disputes and when a deal starts to go bad, I personally, from my perspective, I want the parties to separate and move on as quickly as possible and not fight about things like deposit. Nevertheless, I understand that people uh, buyers and sellers may be reluctant. Agents may be reluctant to check this box going in. You don't have to. I just point out that it's there and there's the sequence. This is the bigger one. This is more narrow. And this is, if any of these events occurs, everybody agrees to cancel and walk away. And again, what's the benefit to the seller for agreeing to that? Well, you know, if the buyer really has a COVID circumstance that's not gonna let them close, it's probably better for the seller to get out of the deal as quickly as possible and go sell to someone else or get the property off the market than it is to languish in one of these deals. And I think a lot of what's gonna determine whether or not the sellers are willing to enter into these things is the seller's bargaining leverage, like it always is. It, are there backup offers? Is it a hot property? Are many people competing for it? Or have these circumstances caused the whole market to cool off such that buyers are very reluctant to commit to anything. Um, it, it, are the people competing these sort of big cash buying flippers who are very aggressive? And if that's the case, if that's the kind of property that we're talking about, you know, a seller may not even consider anything like this. Uh, but for a standard residential purchase, uh, you know, these are the types of provisions that I think buyers and sellers are both going to benefit from. And incidentally, someone pointed out to me, which I wasn't really thinking of, but if the buyer is, needs assurance to buy the property from the seller, and if it's a residential property, uh, more likely than not, the seller is gonna be looking to purchase another property with the proceeds of the sale. So the seller, as a buyer, is gonna wanna seek the same pr uh, protections for the seller's upleg. And that may be an additional argument that we can use or a rationale that we can use to persuade sellers that this, this is ultimately in their benefit in addition to the other things that we've talked about. Now, I'm gonna switch over to a, a car memo which was just recently put out, which explains a lot of these things. So we're gonna go over stuff again, but there's gonna be some subtle uh, insights that I think we'll, we'll take away from it. Um, 
The last thing here is that they have an other provision. Almost all of the CAR documents contain these other provisions. They're in almost everything, and it gives the parties to write in something that they want to add to this agreement. You know, the listing agreement has a section for other provisions. The purchase agreement has a section for other provisions. In theory, you can attach, you can say other provisions, and you can attach an addendum to this, but, 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 um, I'm constantly telling people that they should be very leery about adding additional language there. I don't think there's a need for it. And I'm always very concerned that people are going to add language that's going to muddy these waters even further, that's going to contradict something in the purchase agreement. Um, you know, all other provisions of the purchase agreement are supposed to be in effect. But if we write something in here that might contradict it, then there could be a problem. What are some of these provisions? Well, you know, the typical thing that I see in these scenarios are people start talking about uh, pass-throughs and per diems and making deposits non-refundable. And I'm, I'm really against those kinds of provisions in almost all situations. And I really don't think they're appropriate here because the whole purpose here is to try to give the buyer assurances. And everyone should also know that there are provisions in the purchase agreement which indicate that the mere attempt to try to do that could be invalid. And um, that's a separate part of the purchase agreement that nobody's really aware of, but as a general rule, I don't like to see those pass-throughs, non-refundables and per diems, but be that as it may, people may do them in other contexts. In this context, um, it's really against the intent of this form. And regardless of what you're putting in there, there's a risk of contradicting these provisions and the provisions in the purchase agreement. So I'd be very careful. If you're going to add language, then obviously we can talk about it. But for the most part, I, I would, I would discourage it as I would in, in most circumstances. There are obviously some exceptions to that. All right. <clears throat> Car came out with this addendum. I mean, I first saw it, I think uh, two days ago, I think, I think I saw it. I think it came out Wednesday night and I didn't see it till Thursday morning. At least that that's what the email chains indicated. And then immediately there was a lot of apparently a lot of feedback and Carr published a clarification addendum or a clarification memo. And the clarification memo says a lot of the stuff that we just talked about, but it says some other interesting things. So I'm going to spend a little time going through it. Uh, so they've gotten a lot of inquiries. That's understandable. They say it's now available on zip forms. Um, I do think that as, as buyer's agents, we have to have our discussions with our buyers about using this form. I think we have to recommend it. And uh, it's up to the buyer to decide if they want it or not. I think the existence of the form now creates a kind of standard of practice that requires us to have this form presented to the buyer, discuss it with the buyer. The buyer can reject it if they want. Um, the, the, the form can be used as an addendum or as a um, amendment to an existing contract. You know, the last class, let's go back to the form for a minute. The last class, someone asked me, does this form apply to leases? And I would tell you that there's nothing to prevent it from being applied to a lease, but it really is created for purchase offers, purchase agreements. There is obviously an other but a lease situation is unlike a purchase situation because in a lease situation, you know, we're obviously, we're not dealing with lenders. We're not dealing with notaries. We're not dealing with as many third party providers and inspectors. A lease situation, from my point of view, other than the terms of the lease, once the terms of the lease are agreed upon, the whole entire lease transaction can basically be done in a relatively short period of time. I mean, it really can be done in a day or two as far as signing the document, making the deposit, and delivering the keys. And um, it's to me, I don't really see COVID circumstances interfering with that. And most importantly, I don't think that any of this stuff helps that because this talks about canceling escrow and refunding deposits. And I just don't think it's really appropriate to use this in lease transactions. But if there's something that comes up that you think this might be appropriate, we could talk about it, but it's really not intended for that. And I, I don't think it's well suited for that. Um, okay. Carr reminds us that this form is not mandatory and it's optional. Not mandatory and optional. Uh, meaning 
It doesn't have to be a part of a transaction and the buyer and the seller don't have to agree to it. And I also talked about other protections that exist in the contract if this agreement is not entered into. And the biggest protection is that the contract says that the buyer can hang on to their contingencies. They don't have to remove them. And the risk of not removing them is that the seller can send a notice to perform and then the seller can cancel. But under that scenario, the contract says that the buyer gets his deposit back. And so uh, there are other ways to achieve this, assuming you haven't removed the contingencies from the buyer point of view. And um, the act of getting to those time frames and having the discussion about, are you gonna remove it or not, may give people bargaining leverage to kind of come up with something to, to provide for what I call the stopgap time period, which is after the removal prior to the close, up to the close. Uh, negotiable element, it's all negotiable. All of this is negotiable. Uh, buyers can check whatever boxes they want. They can check all the boxes. The seller can come back and say, well, we don't want uh, box two or box three, et cetera. And I've talked about ways in which even if box two and three aren't checked, you can still, uh, I think, uh, get your buyer under the protection of paragraph one. It's just that it's a 30-day paragraph as opposed to a more immediate paragraph, uh, et cetera. Um, okay, uh, this talks about uh, paragraph one. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't really add to what we've talked about. I'm sure we can all think about things that would prevent or get in the way of the close of escrow on a timely basis. We've talked about some of them. Third parties may not go and inspect or, or make repairs. Uh, appraisers may not be as readily available to come out. Um, lenders may be slow right now. Um, and people may not be able to get before notaries. Notaries may uh, shutter their businesses and they may not want to meet and greet people. And that's a, um, you know, that's a personal exchange. Uh, the notary has to be satisfied. I don't know if there are technological ways to overcome that. But these are all things that could get in the way. Um, we've talked about how it can benefit a buyer because obviously if the buyer gets caught in a situation where through no fault of their own, they've, they've removed all their contingencies, but they can't close on time through no fault of their own, then their deposits at risk. And when we're representing buyers, that's a very important concern for us to be mindful of. Um, you know, obviously we want to get to the close, but if for any reason we don't get to the close, we want the you know, we want the buyer to have had all the opportunities to protect their deposit as best they can. And once they remove contingencies, the contract says, in effect, that they're ready to go forward and that's what puts their deposit at risk. Uh, but the but Carr also indicates that there's a seller concern here and there's a seller benefit to having this form. I'm just gonna zoom in on this a little bit. And uh, this is unusual. I didn't really think of this when they first talked about it, but um, it's possible, as I think I mentioned earlier, that a seller may not be able to sign documents or may not be able to get to a notary to sign documents. And if the buyer has performed everything and the buyer is fully ready to close, and if for whatever reason the seller can't close, or let's just say the seller takes ill and they need to be in quarantine, and for that reason, they really don't want to or can't be displaced from their home right now. It's just too impractical or impossible for them. In theory, if the seller doesn't have this provision in place to protect them, then in theory, the buyer can say, well, you're in default seller and I'm gonna send a demand to close. And if you don't comply, then I'm gonna file a lawsuit for what's called specific performance. And I'm gonna file something called a list pendant. Now that is an extremely, it, it's a rare remedy. The buyer always has this right. In my experience, most buyers do not enforce it, but they have the right. And when we're having discussions with sellers about having these terms in there, it's worth pointing out to them that the buyers have available remedies as well. And there are benefits that the seller can have by having this form, even though on its face, it looks like the form pretty much only uh, benefits the buyer. I think on its face it does, but there are also important benefits that a seller can have, and you never know when the shoe's gonna be on the other foot, and it's the seller 
who actually can't go forward with the transaction. As, as rare as that may seem, in this ever-changing world that we're living in right now, it may be a lot more common than it's been in the past. Uh, we, we can't say for certain. Um, Carr tried in this addendum to uh, uh, calm down concerns that this was sort of a uh, ultimate get out of the transaction card for buyers. In other words, people read the form and they initially said, well, it looks like the buyer can just sort of cancel for all these reasons. And Carr pointed out that that's not what it was designed to do. We talked about how the language in the form was couched in terms of events that were impossible and impractical um, and it's directly related to the uh, the virus um, it's not intended to help people just because they get cold feet um, uh, it's only att attempting to get at situations where the buyer's ability to close or anyone's ability to close has really been impaired to the point that it's impossible or impractical Carr points out that there's a good faith requirement in our contract, and it's true, the contract does contain a provision that says, any exercise of a contingency or cancellation right under this agreement will be exercised in good faith. Even if there wasn't that express clause in our contract, there are statutes in place in California that say that every contract is subject to what's called an implied covenant of good faith and fair dealing, and so, this form is intended not to interfere with those good faith reasons. And this form, just like the entire contract, is governed to a requirement of good faith. Now, I frequently get questions of what is good faith? Well, good faith is everyone agrees when they enter into a contract that they will all try in good faith to achieve the purpose of the contract. The contract can't address every single detail but one of the phrases in the contract is the buyer shall try in good faith to obtain a loan well if the buyer tries to sabotage their loan in theory they're acting not in good faith and in bad faith and if the buyer does nothing to obtain a loan and then says i couldn't get a loan in theory the buyer's not acting in good faith that's just an example of what good faith means but it applies to all of the terms and provisions in the contract. And what Carr is telling us here is that this is not an attempt to eliminate that good faith provision. It's an attempt to address situations where due to unforeseen covert circumstances, <clears throat> the ability to close on time or the ability to close at all has been rendered not possible or not practical. And again, not practical is a little bit higher than just difficult. Paragraph two is optional and it says what we've already discussed. In particular, paragraph two allows the buyer to um, have a sort of a sub loan contingency, which would exist after removal of the loan contingency. If the buyer is unable to fund their loan due to a loss of income from COVID related issues. And we've just talked about one of them, which literally just came up within the last day. Um, Again, another way to address this contingency, if for any reason it's not in the agreement, is a buyer can just hang on to their loan contingency until they feel very sure or they're positive that they're actually getting the loan. And it's possible in these circumstances in today's climate where buyer's agents can have discussions with listing agents and say, look, uh, everything's going smoothly with the loan, but we've heard stories. And, you know, my buyer is very reluctant to remove the loan contingency and, you know, we're going to proceed, but my buyer is concerned about that and I really think we're going to close, but this is why we haven't removed it yet. You know, you can have that conversation. You don't have to raise that issue. You can if you want. You can wait for the listing agent to ask about it. You can address it up front. You can try to get this addendum or amendment. And if you don't get the addendum or amendment when you initially ask for it, you can circle back when it's time to remove your loan contingency and say, well, you know, we, we sought that protection on the front end, you wouldn't give it to us, so now my buyer is a little reluctant to remove the loan contingency. And by the way, we're only nine days, seven days away from the close, so let's just wait it out. That's just a, a possible tool for addressing that. You are all better at being salespeople than I am, and you know your clients and the agents and the transactions better than I do. 
uh, just from a lawyer perspective, these are some of the tools that you can employ to have these conversations. Uh, paragraph three is, uh, is as short and sweet as paragraph three was in the agreement that if these conditions occur, impossibility, impracticability to close due to a COVID condition or circumstance, then the buyer and the seller can agree up front that they're just gonna cancel, walk away, and return the buyer's deposit. All of these paragraphs have the parties canceling and returning the deposit to the buyer if, if the parties choose to exercise them. And generally speaking, as agents, that's what we want. I know that sometimes on the listing side, we get a little upset when a buyer, uh, when, when we feel a deposit is forfeit, and I can understand that, and I think that is an important motivation and emotion to have in these deals, but at the end of the day, as a listing agent, we typically, we don't earn a nickel from that deposit, despite how important it may be, and focusing on the deposit is not helping us do what we really do to get paid, which is sell the property, and, um, uh, having a deposit fight between a buyer and a seller doesn't prevent a seller from selling the property. The seller can absolutely sell to someone else, but the general rules require that that subsequent buyer be notified that there is not yet a mutually signed cancellation. And the typical procedure is to give that buyer a contingency that gives the buyer the right to cancel. If they don't get the mutually signed cancellation, most buyers, in fact, Almost all the buyers in that situation, they, they never exercise that contingency, but we typically have to give them that contingency. And if there's a deposit dispute, escrow where the deposit dispute is pending can't close, it has to go to another escrow, all of which is doable, but you can see how deposit disputes, I'm not sure they really help us as agents. And I understand it's important to fight for deposits, but at the end of the day, it's not really helping us get paid and get the job done. Um, happy to talk about deposit disputes as they arise. Sometimes they're very clear and the seller should get it, but in almost all situations, it doesn't really help us as agents. Uh, paragraph four entitled other and Carr is reminding us what I told you earlier. Um, you should be cautious about putting in language that is vague or unclear. And we can get blamed if we propose language that's vague or unclear. Um, and you know, the, the examples of that are legion. The best way to avoid ambiguous or unclear language is simply not to add any language at all. These agreements have enough language in them and they have enough provisions and they're evolved enough, especially the purchase agreement, that there's really not a lot of good reason to add language to it. I understand some circumstances arise where it's necessary. If it does, by all means, please reach out to me and we'll talk about it. But for the most part, the agreement tends to incorporate all the language you need. We can't force people to use this. Nobody is required to use this. It's for them to decide if they want to use it, them being the buyer and the seller. And it's for them to decide what provisions or boxes. Uh, however, I will say that once again, from the buyer's point of view, I think we're obligated to present this form to the buyer and have a discussion with them about why we think it's helpful and necessary. And I think buyers are gonna to want to have some sort of assurance before they make offers. And I think that sellers, uh, even though they may not initially like these things, I think that ultimately sellers have to understand that this climate's changing. And if buyers don't feel secure in proceeding, that's gonna have a chilling effect, in my opinion, on offers and marketability and ultimately sale price of the property. But again, you guys know those circumstances better than I do. Lastly, and finally, Carr reminds you what I constantly remind you, which is that we're not supposed to give, you are not supposed to give legal advice to your buyers and sellers. I'm not supposed to give legal advice to your buyers and sellers. When you guys contact me and you say, I have a legal question for my buyer and seller, I'm very happy to tell you what I think the answer is because you're my client and I want to inform you and I want you to be empowered to have an intelligent discussion with your clients but I don't want to be in a situation where you're giving them legal advice and or you're just passing on the legal advice that I give you. And when that happens, it almost always happens in the form of, well, I talked to my lawyer and he said this, and then the buyer or seller say, well, ask your lawyer this. And before I know it, you know, I have to cut that off. So be mindful of giving legal advice to your clients. I know you want to be informed and I know you want to give them intelligent information and I'll do my best to empower and equip you to do that. But at the end of the day, 
if they have legal questions about this or anything, they're going to have to talk to their own counsel. And that's not just me beating that drum. That's what Carr says too. And as someone who typically has to defend agents in a lot of these actions, um, you know, we're always getting accused of offering opinions and doing things that we're really not supposed to do. Uh, but I understand it's tarred out there in the field. You're trying to, you're trying to make people get to their transactions. So it's, it's difficult to monitor that. Hopefully that's what I'm here for. And you can talk to me and I can help pull you away from that. So I've done my best to exhaust all of you. Looks like I just went nonstop for 57 minutes. I'm sorry. Uh, it, it's in my blood. I have an inexhaustible ability to bore you all to death. Forgive me. If there are questions that people want to ask, I'm more than happy to try to answer them. And I understand people may want to jump and run, but I'm going to sit here and see if anybody has any questions. Hey, Peter, this was great. And uh, again, this is Ed speaking. Just for a lot of people joined the call late, just wanted to remind everybody that you were all, when you joined in, you were all put to mute because we wanted to keep the audio clear so that uh, Peter could speak clearly. Uh, so if you have a question, please, uh, there's a button, a on the bottom left of your of your Zoom screen, there's a button to unmute yourself. So if you have a question, uh, just go ahead and do so and and chime in. I don't know if you can hear me. This is Alex. Hello, Alex. Hi. Um, so I am in escrow. Um, I have not removed any contingencies yet. I am uh, my inspection contingencies up today. Loan is proceeding, uh, appraisal came in, but I'm just wondering if I should, if can I, A, use this document at all, and B, should I? <laughs> I mean, I'm not foreseeing any issues right now. Those, those are great, those are great questions. Uh, let's, you know, whenever people call me about a transaction, do you wanna know the question I almost always ask, which I consider to be one of the most important questions in these transactions, and, and it's amazing. They, it's usually not told to me. I usually have to ask for it. My question to you is, when is the schedule close of escrow? We're supposed to close April 7th. Okay, April 7th. So what is that? That's uh, 17 days from now. So, um, yeah. so you're 17 days away from the close. And I always think that agents should focus on the schedule close because they need to keep mindful of that finish line. Um, I think that, you know, you should discuss this with your buyer and um, you should have a discussion with your buyer to see if you think, you know, I, I don't know if there's going to be any problems here. Everything looks rosy, as they say, and it may be the case that you don't want to rock the boat, but I think uh, given that Carr has this form, uh, before you remove contingencies, I think you should have a discussion with your buyer. And I think you should say, Carr just came out with this form because of the COVID situation. I honestly don't know if this is going to apply to us. And more importantly, buyer, I don't know if the seller is going to agree to it. And that's really the, the major problem here. I mean, if, if, if your buyer sells form, your buyer might say, well, heck, check all the boxes, send it in, let's see what they do. Uh, but the seller may never agree. And you know your listing agent better than I, you probably have a better sense of the seller better than I. Is the seller gonna get, hey, where's this coming from? I'm nervous. And now maybe the seller starts to enforce your contingencies. And in my experience, many listing agents don't enforce these contingencies with notice to perform. They just sort of let them hang out there. Um, so it, it, it's difficult to say for certain, I think that um, it's probably appropriate to talk to your buyer about this and you guys can talk about whether this form's necessary or not necessary. Keep in mind that it's not a guarantee that the seller is going to agree to it and presenting it to the seller may only cause the seller to have a heightened sense of concern um, and you've still got protection in terms of your contingencies, but once your buyer removes both of those contingencies or all of them, they now have that sort of window period that for me, I worry about because that's when a COVID circumstance could hit and they've removed contingencies. And one way is to not remove those contingencies, one way to protect. The other way is to provide this stopgap protection. And uh, you can talk about it with your buyer. If you present something to your seller, uh, to the seller, and the seller says no, 
Then when the listing agent pushes back and says, why haven't you removed contingencies? You say, well, you know, it's a whole different world out there. And, you know, we, we have this form and we thought we ought to address these concerns. You said, no, I understand that. I respect that. Good for you. But that's why we're not doing it right now. And by the way, now we're only 12 days away from close. And I'm a lot closer to getting you and your seller paid than anybody. So maybe we can work together on this and not worry about that so much. Let's get this horse and buggy across the finish line. By the way, now we're only 10 days away. You know, uh, that, 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 that's sort of my thinking. Every situation yeah. is different. That's what I was thinking too. Now we're I not don't want to now freak them out. Eight days, we're getting close. Right. And if yeah. the seller doesn't really have viable backups, and if the seller is really nervous about putting a property back on the market in today's climate, which I think are legitimate concerns, I think you have a lot of discussion leverage and, um, you know, play it as you will. Right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay. That was great, Alex and Peter. And uh, I, Andrew, I mean, uh, Peter, I'm not sure if you see the in the chat bar on the side, but Andrew Woodward had a great question and I'll read it. It says, do you think this addendum will be used to disclose COVID sickness and death to buyers similar to the AIDS disclosure was used in the past? Well, um, first of all, we already have existing law in effect, contract law and statutory law, which if we have an obligation to disclose material facts, uh, seller does, and um, that obligation exists all the way up through the close of escrow. And if there's, a, if there's an occupant death in the property uh, that's recent, there's an obligation to disclose that. So all of these are material facts. And uh, I think that if there is a COVID issue, I do think there's an obligation to disclose that regardless of whether these forms are entered into. Um, uh, so I do think that the COVID issue itself is going to create disclosure issues. And, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have to, uh, if, if listing agents become aware of that, if sellers become aware of that, anytime someone comes to me and says, do I have to disclose this? I said, you've already answered the question uh, because you asked. And if you have to ask, then I think you have to disclose. <clears throat> so, um, our environment today is going to lead to new disclosure issues. I personally don't think that this form is going to affect those disclosure issues. I guess if escrow gets extended by 30 days, that increases the possibility that there could be a COVID event on the property, and then that becomes subject to disclosure. And I also think that in today's environment, the existence of such event, uh, from a buyer's point of view, could be a material fact. And under the contract, if a new material fact is discovered, um, it, there is a limited right of a buyer to cancel. Uh, so th the contract provides for these types of disclosures of material facts already. Obviously, the addendum will give further protection to that. Um, I guess, in theory, focusing on these issues will lead people to consider talking about them and disclosing more about them. So I suppose indirectly, it could have additional disclosure um, uh, emphasis or impact, but I think the disclosure impact or the, the rules regarding disclosure already exist by operation of the contract and by operation, operation of law. But it's a this great, is great content. Anybody else, anybody other, any other questions out there? I, I think we may uh, be ready to wrap this up here unless anybody else has any other questions. Uh, this is probably a never-ending topic, and I'm sure we'll have <laughs> other discussions. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I commend you all for the hard work and the good efforts you're doing. I know it's tough right now, uh, but um, I, I do believe all this will pass. It's very easy to say that, but uh, I, I think we'll all get through this. It's just, I think it's going to take a while. And I'll give you help as much as I can. See that, Alicia. What wonderful. And uh, so I just unmuted everybody. If, if you guys all want to ch chime in and say a thanks to uh, uh, to Peter Haven here, who, who gave a, a, a wonderful talk. So I know I learned a ton. And I was super grateful for it. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. Thank all of you for putting up. Thank you. This is Shafiq, too. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Peter. Take care. Okay. Right, thanks, everybody. Thank you.
Okay, we'll Thanks, wrap it up there. And, and uh, please be on the lookout in your emails for f further talks like this. Um, Peter, it's so great to have you. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be uh, uh, in touch and letting you guys know more as we know. We'll um, be in touch but, figuratively, if not literally, but thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I will Dad, say, do you want to mention the shift call? Shift yeah, class. A couple, couple of things I want to mention to, to all of you at Keller Williams Larchmont. Uh, there is a nine o'clock <laughs> Zoom call. Uh, Joey, Joey, and Piper and myself were all on there this morning, along with there was like ten of us on there. Uh, so it, well, let me mute everybody. Mute everybody. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, okay. So there, there are nine o'clock. There's a nine o'clock Zoom call every morning, uh, Monday through Friday. So we'll have one again on Monday. Please join there if you'd like. That's a good chance to see everybody's faces and just get a little positive energy. Starting on Monday, there will be a shift study class starting at 4 o'clock p.m. Uh, it's recommended that you get the shift book so that you can start reading it or the audio book, all available on Amazon, Kindle. You can go to Keller Inc. and get them. Um, but it is not required to attend the shift class that is starting. Uh, it's going to be 4 o'clock uh, on Monday through Friday, uh, starting this coming Monday. Um, hope to see you guys all there. Uh, I'm available to you. Joey's available to you. If you got uh, Piper, if you guys need anything at all, shoot us an email, shoot us a text. I'm, uh, I love hearing from you guys. We will all get through this together. Uh, love being a part of this company. And um, yeah, great to see you guys. We'll, we'll talk to you again soon. All right. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Oh, one last thing. This call will be recorded. If you guys uh, didn't get enough out of the first time and have a question, you can go back and listen to it again uh, as soon as we figure out where to put that. It's going to be on the private YouTube page, but we'll, we'll include that in an email so you guys know where to find it. All right. Take care, everybody. See you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Stay safe, everybody.